Hi everybody, I'm Joe Parker of the Pixel Depot, where we give model railroaders the tools and services they need to build a realistic layout and the motivation to work on it right now. From a very early age, we learn by asking questions. In pretty much every video I do, I encourage people to leave questions and suggestions in the comments. People do often leave questions for me, and I do my best to answer them if I can. But I realize that often other viewers don't see those answers because they're not going through the comments. So like I did a few months back, I've compiled a list of questions that I've been asked in various videos for the past couple of months, and I'm going to go through the answers for you now. I will include a link to all those videos in the description below. I'll probably also create a playlist so that it's easy for people to find those. And if I talk about specific products in my answers, I will also include an affiliate link. Now I do get a little bit of money from those affiliate links if you click on them and then buy. This really does help me out and help me to continue to make videos for the channel. And I will say in advance, thank you very much. So it is allergy season here at the Pixel Depot and I have had an allergy related cough and tickle in my throat for the last couple of weeks. <coughs> <coughs> cough is gonna kill me so doing this video ought to be an adventure but let's see how things go after i did the last q a video one of the first things that showed up in the comments was another question and that question was from the crooked river in eastern and he said i'd love to see your main layout forgive me for not knowing but do you have a channel for it the answer to that is yes and this is it so you're in the right place for sure for this particular channel my goal has been to instruct people on how to do model railroading and so i decided to build the project layout of the grunge in order to do that so the grunge has been primarily the focus over the past year or so but the monuments City Terminal Division, or the MCTD for short, does show up from time to time. That usually shows up as an operating video or a layout update kind of video, but I haven't done a ton of things on that in terms of construction, but some of those things are definitely coming. The I-895 bridge was certainly a construction project. For a little while now, I've been talking about moving on to the second phase of construction for the MCTD. To be honest, the inflation on lumber has been keeping me from doing that, but hopefully things are kind of settling out now and I should be able to go back and do that. What that has meant from the planning standpoint is that I've been working on the track plan. And the reason for that is that no matter how hard I've tried so far, I have not been completely satisfied with the design for that northern end of the layout, or Railroad East is probably what I should say. There is a playlist on the channel that focuses on the operating sessions and layout updates for the MCTD, and they'll also show up in the playlist that I create for this video for reference as well. So I hope you'll check those out. So this one goes back to the video I did a while ago on adding a backdrop for the grunge layout. So this was probably a year or so ago. But the question came up of how did I make the backdrop photo? Simo said, I really like your background photo, would work great on my up and coming shelf layout. How were they made? The answer to that is that I found some pictures online from a site called textures.com where I found a set of walls and what I did was manipulate them in Photoshop to create a single long image. That image ended up being about 55 inches long and seven inches high. Now the backdrop on the layout is 90 something inches. So what I ended up doing was printing two of those and butting them up together. To get them printed out, I broke the image up into printable chunks, printed them on plain paper, and then used spray adhesive to attach them to the backdrop. What I would probably do if I were to do it again would be to print them on adhesive paper because I think it would stick a little better. In the humidity of the basement down here, some of the paper with the spray adhesive is bunching up and kind of bubbling. So it's not working out maybe as, as well as I would have hoped to. I did promise to do a video on that process that I have not done yet. It is, however, on the docket and it'll certainly be within the next couple that I do. So stay tuned for a little while. In my video on building resin structures for the grunge, Charlie Rumsfeld asked, what is the table saw that you have that cut the wall sections down in that video? The answer to that is that it is a Dremel MS-20-01 Moto Saw. It's essentially a portable band saw or scroll saw that you can use either as a handheld, although I've never done that and think that might be a little bit dangerous, or attached to a bench or table. I've had this one for quite a number of years and it is handy for doing small projects like this because it's very easy to set up and take down. The white mock-up that you see behind me is going to be Darlington Electronic Instruments on the layout, and that is a kit bash. So I'll be using the saw to cut down the walls on that one as well. These saws are still available. You can get them on Amazon, and I'll include an Amazon affiliate link in the description below. After the last operating session on the grunge, Lee Gorchek asked, what do I think about DPM structures? The reason that he asked that is that the structure in the corner that represents Laida's joint is indeed a DPM kit. 
Now, the answer to that is that I really like the full building kits. The one for Laida's joint is made from a Carol's Corner Cafe kit. It was easy to build. There's good detail. I'm actually building a clone for it to put on the main layout, and I'm probably going to build another one maybe to sell. So if that's something you're interested in, let me know. Kits I would go for all day long. The modulars, however, are a different story. So I've built a number of structures using the DPM modular kits, and it always seems like a great idea. And to be honest, the pieces are very sturdy. They've got good detail and, and they do go together pretty easily. The problem that I have with them is that they never seem to be quite uniform. As I'm building these, these long curtain walls, what I tend to find is that there are gaps in certain places because you can't quite file them to be perfectly flat or perfectly straight, no matter how much you try. So I've relegated all these to something that I would use on the backdrop rather than something that would be a, a structure that is front and center. For my latest project, I'm using it to represent the Crown Cork and Seal building, which is a very, very long building that's going to go in the corner behind the Cambridge Iron and Metal building that's on the layout. The other challenge that I have, especially with larger structures like this one, is bracing. The flexing that takes place on those buildings can be difficult. If you're planning to build a very large building with DPM modulars, those are some things to take into consideration. And again, I don't want to make it sound like I'm bad-mouthing them because for small structures and so on, they can be really handy. But what I tend to try and use them for are the bigger structures, and that doesn't always work out as well as I might hope. In that same video, Napa asked, I have a 74 inch by 22 inch layout space. Do you think I can do something like the grunge in that space as this is my first layout? My answer to him was absolutely. At the time I did offer to help Napa out and work with him to put together a plan for a layout that would fit that space. That offer goes for other people as well. I do offer consulting services for track planning, for layout planning, for site planning, or even just talking through what you would like to do and what's possible, not only in a small space, but also in a larger space. So if you're interested in doing work with me along those lines, feel free to contact me either in the comments or the email that's associated with this channel. You can find that in the about tab up above, or you can connect up with me on my Facebook channel. The links for that will be in the description below. But now that the pitch is over, I do believe that these small layout spaces can have very satisfying layouts put into them. I don't know why so many people wait and wait and wait for the day when they have this huge basement space in order to start building their layout, when you can really have a satisfying layout in a small space. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to join my Patreon community to get bonus videos, graphic files, and other goodies, click on the link in the description below. So this is probably a good time to answer this particular question. After the highlights video, Jeff Hankey asked, just curious, why is your Patreon level called the GP38-2? Chessie never rostered any GP38-2s. CSX got them all from the Seaboard side of the merger. Now, I did know that, and so that's not where the naming for the tiers came from. For those that haven't looked at the Patreon page, the tiers are the GP15-1 tier, the GP38-2 tier, the SD40-2 tier, and the SD80 Mac tier. All those refer to engines that Conrail had. Chessie did have GP15s, but they were GP15Ts. They were a little different from the GP15-1, and nobody until the split of Conrail had SD80 Macs except for Conrail. So anyone that's watched any of the MCTD videos probably knows that Chessie is the primary railroad that I model. The layout also has some representation of the Canton Railroad, as well as some Conrail operations. But that said, I did know what Jeff was talking about, about GP38-2s. As it turns out, one of my favorite locomotives to run on the layout is a Conrail GP38-2 model. I believe it's a Genesis, Atherm Genesis model. And I really do sometimes wish that Chessie had GP38-2s because the sound on it is really cool. But alas, they did not roster any GP38-2s, preferring the turbocharged GP40-2s of which they were the largest buyer. Having said all that, I grew up with Conrail, and it has always been among my favorite railroads. It's a very close second to Chessie, if not a tie. It's kind of hard to say. In fact, on day one of Conrail, the house that we were living in, you could see the Conrail mainline from the house. So the Patreon channel is someplace that I'm trying to make more of an interactive community. I've provided some downloads there of signs and different things. There's a couple of blooper videos up there. There's some expanded videos of content that I've put here on the channel in case you need some more details. Having said all that, I would really appreciate it if you would join as a patron, and the link is in the description below. 
If you're enjoying this video, please take a second to click the like button. This will help more people see it. You can also click subscribe so that you never miss an episode and also press the bell so that you'll get notified when there is new content available. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And the links for those are in the description below. Once again, from the highlights video, Jonathan Greenleys asked, what type of cans does your factory produce? So the structure behind me is an American can structure. They receive can stock and ship out cans. The answer to that is, I never really thought about it too much. I just sort of assumed they were the cans that you would use for vegetables and, and so on. Although I suppose that soda cans and other things could be an option. So I guess the answer to that is, Steel cans that are used for vegetables and other things that you would buy at the grocery store. This question goes back to another video that I did quite some time ago about wiring a small layout. So it was when I was doing the wiring for the grunge layout. And Greg Munkowski asked, why didn't you break the bus line where the two modules join? So for those that may not know, the layout behind me is actually built in two sections and attached in the middle. Now I could have built it so that it was detachable in the middle, but part of the reason I built it out of gator foam was so that it would be light enough to transport without having to do that. So the answer to Greg's question is really, I never planned to break it up and carry it in two different sections. So that's why I didn't bother to break the bus line. I certainly could have done that. And if I had used more traditional materials, I guess, such as uh, dimensional wood or plywood to build the bench work for it, I probably would have done that because weight would have been much more of a concern. Given that gator foam is so light, it's very easy to pick that whole layout up and move it around. A little bulky and maybe not the easiest thing to get around corners, but very, very light. I would once again recommend gator foam for multiple modeling purposes. I used it for bench work here. I also used it for the backdrop. So I'd strongly recommend using that. And if you do, please contact my friend Gator Dave Myers, who will hook you up with gator foam. I'll put a link to that in the description as well. Not too long ago, I did a video on making a mortar wash, and it's the wash that I ended up using on the Parkview Terrace tenement house that is now on the end of the grunge layout. So Donald Troyer asked, what proportion of paint and alcohol did you settle on? That would make a great tip. And it would make a great tip if I could give you a solid definitive answer. In this particular case, I can't do that. I kind of mixed it until it looked right and felt right in terms of consistency and look. My guess is, is that it is somewhere around a one to 10 paint to alcohol mix. Could be one to 12, even one to 15. 1 to 10 is generally where I start because it gives you enough of an alcohol base in order for things to flow and, and kind of blend into the mortar lines and so on and so forth. But again, it's one of those things that I play with until it looks, feels, and moves right. Sorry, I can't give you a better answer, but that is the absolute truth. In my video on reviewing and installing the ProTech Signal, John Wynn Stanley said, why don't you just put a straw or other item through the hole with all your other wiring attached so that you don't have to solder under the layout and connect that up to the switch machine. So what we ended up doing in that install was soldering a stiffer piece of wire to the very thin wires that were attached to the signal and running that through the hole that we had drilled. A straw may have worked as well. My concern there would have been that the straw, at least a typical drinking straw would have been way too wide for that and would have been a very large hole to try and cover up in the layout. People have suggested in the past using the thinner straws that are used for coffee stirs and so on. Again, the wires are thin on the signal, so that may have worked in this particular case, but the stirrer is actually the other end of that. So the, the drinking straw is very wide, the stirrer is very narrow. So I'm not sure that either one of those would have provided me with what I was looking for. Certainly something to try in the future, but that is the reason we didn't use a drinking straw in this particular case. In that same video, I got another question from Lee Gorchek. So thank you, Lee, for watching multiple videos and being so engaged. That goes for all of my regular watchers of the videos. I can't tell you how much I appreciate all of the support that you give me and all of the engagement that goes along with that. It really is humbling and fun to know that there's an audience out there that really does like what I'm doing. And that really helps me keep on going. But that's neither here nor there for the purposes of the question. The question was, can you use these with Bachman turnouts? So the answer to that is, is that I believe you can because the signal is not actually connected to the turnout itself. The signal control is actually based on the tortoise switch machine that is underneath the layout. So as long as you can use a tortoise machine with the switch or turnout that you happen to be using, I don't see any problem with using these signals with that particular turnout. 
In my video on weathering an Arco covered hopper, Ray Miracle, I hope I said that right, says, I have a question on your India ink. Do you use alcohol-based burnt umber? Would you be able to tell me where I could pick some of this up? So I do use Liquitex India ink for this. They do sell a burnt umber color. And then once again, I dilute that down to somewhere between 1 to 60 and 1 to 120, uh, depending on how heavily I want that to go on. Dilute that down with 70% isopropyl alcohol and then use that as the wash. The ink is available from various places, including my affiliates Blick Art Supplies and Amazon. I will include links to those in the description below. Now, in my video on changing rules on freelance cars, I used a magnifier in order to be able to see the very tiny writing that was on that particular car. As a result, Red Butler asked, could you tell me the name of that magnifier you're using to see the detail? So the answer to that is that it is a Carson 5x Mini Bright LED slide out aspheric magnifier. So there's a mouthful for you. So these are really handy to have around in order to see small detail, small printing, anything that's not easily seen with the naked eye, and that's what I use them for. They do come in handy in lots of different scenarios, including those that are not related to model railroading, so I would suggest these highly. These are available on Amazon. I will put an affiliate link in the description, but you should be aware that these come in a couple of different varieties. The one that I have here is a five times magnification. They also have a three times magnification version. They also come in single single packs and multiple packs. So as you're looking around for those, make sure that you're finding the one that you really do want. So after my most recent video on doing details for the Parkview Terrace tenement, I got a couple of comments about the street scene that was there. Tim Wright said, have you thought about making a hole so that your dead end road can go under the building? Maybe a small mirror in the background to give it some more depth. We got another comment from Peter Schmidt who said, I was thinking you might be able to put a shipping bay for semi trucks there to make it look like a usable place rather than just the backdrop. So both of those are reasonable ideas, but keep in mind that the grunge layout is only 15 inches deep and that the street scene is directly perpendicular to the backdrop. Both of those are kind of disasters when it comes to trying to have a transition that is realistic between the backdrop and the layout. Your viewing angle is never going to be quite right and your viewing distance is so close to the edge that covering up that transition is going to be tough. Now I could use a mirror and I have actually used a mirror on the Monument City Terminal Division layout to mask a transition and the Canton Railroad Yard. But the problem here is that it is so close to the viewer that Nine times out of 10, the viewer is probably going to see themselves in that mirror. I don't think it's going to give the right impression based on this, just the way that most people are going to be viewing that. In terms of covering it up and putting a loading dock or something there, from the layout point of view, that street is the only access to the alley that I'm trying to represent with the, and I did want to have that visual representation of a connection to the real world. And also I think it gives a nice division between the industrial side on the left and the more residential and commercial side on the right. So you've got the, the tenement and Laida's joint, which isn't supposed to be a bar on the right hand side. And then on the left hand side are all the industries. So I'm hesitant to make that kind of change. All that said, I am aware that that transition is rough and I'm trying to figure out ways to mask that. I may put a construction scene there, although that's somewhat overdone on a lot of layouts. So I'm a little bit hesitant about that. So I am considering ways to cover that up. Right now it looks like there's a stop sign that is butted right up against a building when in reality there's supposed to be a street in between. You don't get that impression as well as I hoped you would. So some sort of scene that I can put there to mask that transition is something that I'm thinking about. I do thank you for those suggestions and recommendations. Like I said, I think they're both good suggestions, but in this particular case, I don't think either of them are going to work the way that I would want them to. So in my video on the new 86 foot tangent boxcars, the, the auto parts boxcars, William asked, do you have a way to get the cars out of the GM building in case there's a derailment or they just won't couple up? So the answer to that is yes, I do. So I've built the structure so that all of the roof panels are removable. The building is actually removable from the layout as well. It's attached to the layout with a, a locking mechanism with Lego. What that locking mechanism does is lock everything in place so that the building doesn't move around or shift. So everything is always going to be lined up. The removable roof panels do mean that I can easily get access in there in the case of a derailment. Knock on wood, I haven't had one yet, but in case anything ever does happen. And so it allows me to have those long strings of relatively long cars, 60 foot cars and 86 foot box cars that go in there without having to worry about a derailment or other problem. 
So that's all for this episode. This is usually where I ask you to put things in the comments, but if you haven't figured out that that's kind of what we're aiming for, then we've probably got a larger issue. As I mentioned, I've created a playlist containing the videos that I've referenced in this video, and you can check those out by clicking at the top left. For other great content from the channel, you can also click down below that. I'm Joe Parker of the Pixel Depot. Thank you so much for watching and so much for taking part in all of these videos, and I hope you'll meet me next time in the train room. <coughs> it's allergy season here at the Pixel Depot. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs>